In their first meeting with the Dodgers this year, the Giants lineup featured the likes of Mauricio Dubon, Tyro Estrada, Kevin Padlow, and Luke Williams, whereas the Dodgers throw out a lineup featuring Mookie Betts, Trey Turner, and Freddie Freeman at the top of the lineup. So we'll talk about what is going on with the state of the Giants dealing with all of these injuries and the COVID outbreak, why it's not as bad as it seems, and so much more. So all of that next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on the show we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites, Beyond the Box Score, and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about these Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And coming up on today's show, as I said, we're going to talk about the fact that this was the Giants lineup, that's the Dodgers lineup. We knew it all along, but really, the Giants lineup, people were already a little bit concerned about them coming into the year. I would say uh, probably people were a little bit too concerned and that they were actually going to be an underrated group that was going to score a lot of runs. And so far, that's been the case, actually. But when you just look at it on paper and you look at a lot of Giants fans probably turned on their TVs last night and were like, who the heck is Kevin Padlow? And how is he in the middle of this Giants lineup playing third base in their first game against the Dodgers this year? Well, there's a reason for it. And a big reason is that they're dealing with so many injuries and a COVID outbreak. And thankfully, help is on the way. So we're going to give you like five different injury updates. And a lot of it is good news. And guys are close to returning. And even at least one guy is probably going to return tonight. But I mean, where to even start? Carlos Rodon was on the mound and he pitched well. There was one inning when he gave up a couple of runs, two walks, and then a two-out, two-strike single by Chris Taylor, and that was basically the game. The Giants only mustered one run. They gave themselves some chances. They out-hit the Dodgers 6-5, to five, but they just couldn't really get that big hit with guys on base. Maybe a big home run with guys on base, or even just any home run would have helped in this game. So Carlos Rodon continued to pitch great. I mean, two runs in six innings. It's not like he's the reason they lost this game. When the Giants lost two out of three to the Nationals, it was the pitching that cost them the series. They they allowed over nine runs per game on average. But in this game, Carlos Rodon went six innings, allowed two runs. All in all, they went. Uh, they allowed only three runs against this loaded Dodgers lineup. Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, Trey Turner, Will Smith, Muncy, Justin Turner, Bellinger, Chris Taylor. It's an all-star lineup, essentially, and the Giants were in this game the whole time. So they just weren't able to get that big hit, and a lot of it has to do with they're missing so many guys. But this is, for the first time in a long time, their right-handed lineup, because they finally saw a left-handed starter in Julio Urias. It had been quite a while. I can't even remember the last time they faced a left-handed pitcher, maybe in Cleveland, Maybe a little bit before they left for Cleveland. I I could be misremembering, but it's been a long time. And so this lineup is somewhat to be expected. I think like we have to we have to understand that when there's a lefty on the mound versus when there's a righty on the mound, the Giants have different lineups. And so Slater at the top is always what we see against a left-handed pitcher. So he was in there and he had two hits. He continues to to look impressive and uh, look like he's going to be a factor up at the top of the lineup against lefties. And even he's been having some at-bats against righties. And he had a good one last night. I think he drew a walk against either uh, Daniel Hudson or Gratterall or even Kimbrell. I can't remember exactly who he faced and walked against, but a tough righty. And then Mauricio Dubon, uh, batting second, playing center field. He's a guy who's potentially on the bubble of this roster. He's out of minor league options, and so he kind of has to prove himself. But it is interesting when there's a lefty out there. I I feel like Dubon has had good at bats all season long whenever he's been out there. There's been some bad base running, which is a, a feature of Mauricio Dubon. He's just done that pretty consistently. 
throughout his major league career. But he's a good defender. He can definitely play center field, and he can also play some infield spots for you. And he just continues to have good at-bats. He had a good at-bat against Urias in the top of the first inning with Slater on base, hit an opposite field gap shot that just Mookie Betts took a good route and ran it down. So I'm not ready to just cut Mauricio Dubon because they're going to have to make some roster decisions with all the guys who are going to be coming back. And the fact that the roster is now at 26, whereas for the first month of the season, it was at 28. So I'm fine with Dubon being in the lineup, being high in the lineup against the lefty. I thought he took good at bats. Darren Ruff went 0 for 4, hit the ball 105 plus miles an hour twice again. This is unfortunately a recurring theme for Darren Ruff, hitting the ball 105 miles an hour or more into outs. He's done it more than anyone I can remember that I've seen. And it's happened all season long. It happened early, and it's happened in the last several days. And he did it again twice last night. A couple of them, I think both of them may have been on the ground. And so that's never ideal. He needs to kind of elevate that launch angle a little bit. And if you're hitting the ball in the air 105 plus miles an hour, that's more where your hits are going to come from. So he was in there. Flores continues to be a bright spot on offense. And he had uh, a hit and a walk last night, including a big walk in the ninth inning against Craig Kimbrell. Brandon Crawford was in there as a lefty against a lefty starter. May have been the only one in the lineup. Yeah, the only lefty in that starting lineup. And he went 0 for 3, just continues to struggle. He did walk at some point, but he hasn't really gotten it going. He led the team basically. He was there he finished fourth in MVP voting in the National League last year. So he was their best player by many metrics. I mean Buster Posey was up there as well and they got contributions from everyone. It wasn't like they were overly reliant on one player. But Crawford was so great, and so far he hasn't really done much offensively. Tyro Estrada had a couple of hits. He had a pretty good game. Kevin Padlow, I thought he took some good at-bats. I think he swung at the first pitch in both of his at-bats, so we didn't get to see much of him. But uh, at least both of his the balls he put in play were a good kind of launch angle in the air on a line. But first one, he may have gotten it off the end of the bat. Second one, I think he may have also gotten it off the end of the bat, but it went into deep left center field. And with a more lively baseball, that ball might be over the fence. But uh, Kevin Padlow is an interesting guy, and we're going to talk about him more in just a minute. Luke Williams also was in there. Luis Gonzalez had a big pinch hit plate appearance where he drove in a run. But then in the ninth inning, he made a questionable decision. So we're going to talk about these two guys and the guys who are returning and who might be on their way out when certain guys return in just a moment. But before we do, whether she prefers a statement piece or everyday subtle elegance, BlueNile.com has fine jewelry options for every mom. Shop high-quality classic diamond earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, or gemstone pendant necklaces. Looking for fine jewelry but having trouble choosing? That's me. Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. Mark Mother's Day with something enduring. Classic diamond stud earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, birthstone pendants, and so much more on BlueNile.com. This Mother's Day, give mom something she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On Giants listeners get $50 off $500. This podcast exclusive is only good through Mother's Day. Use code LOCKEDON. That's code LOCKEDON. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace at BlueNile.com today. All right, here we go. We're going to talk more about how the heck did Kevin Padlow end up on the San Francisco Giants. I think a lot of fans probably tuned in and were wondering, who is Kevin Padlow? And yet there he is in the lineup for a team that Won 107 games last year, went toe-to-toe with this Dodgers team that won 106, and here they are the next year in their first game, and this was the lineup that they were throwing out there. I think it's like some a point I want to make is like before Lamont Wade Jr. was Lamont Wade Jr., he was a Kevin Padlow. Like a lot of people were like, who is this guy? Same with Mike Yastrzemski. So 
there's a reason that they target the guys that they target. And I think that if we, when we do a little bit of a deep dive on Kevin Padlow, you're going to see that against a lefty starter, it made all the sense in the world to call him up. They optioned Mike Ford, who you also might be thinking, who was he? Or you might have thought that when he was in the lineup the last couple of days against the Nationals. But he also had he had a big hit in that series against the Nationals. It didn't ultimately lead to a win, but it was a big bases loaded hit. So anyway, thanks for making Locked On Giants your first listen. Uh, for your second listen, check out check out the Locked On Now podcast. Recaps of MLB games with analysis from our local experts, taking fans through the season like no other network, free and available wherever you get podcasts. So yeah, Kevin Padlow. I don't think we did talk about him actually. Uh, he was acquired via a minor trade a few days ago or about a week ago. The Giants have made several minor trades using cash to kind of purchase players who had recently been designated for assignment. So they're like last in waiver priority, or I don't actually know if it's based on last season still, or if it's now based on this season's record. But anyway, when you're a bad team, you get top waiver priority. So like you can you can claim guys who have been designated for assignment and placed on waivers. And if multiple teams claim that player, the team with the worst record gets the player. It starts uh, teams in the same league get first priority and then teams in the other league. So if it's an American League team that DFA is a guy, American League teams get first priority in order of record in reverse. So the worst teams get the top priority. Anyway, the Giants are no longer near the top of the priority food chain because they have a good record, which, by the way, is 14-9 and nine with a plus-32 run differential, uh, which has an expected win-loss record of 15-8. and eight. So they continue to underperform that by one game. It's been that way for several days here. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But Kevin Padlow, I just want to say, so he had been designated for assignment. Was it... I don't even remember the, I think it was the Seattle Mariners who had DFA'd Kevin Padlow. He was originally with the Colorado Rockies and then was part of the Jake McGee trade that sent McGee from the Rays to the Rockies and the Rays acquired Kevin Padlow as part of that exchange. So then he was in the Rays system from 2016 through 2019, maybe even 2020. He didn't play in 2020 because of the cancellation of the minor league season. And he ended up, oh, actually, yeah, he was with the Rays still in 2021. And then he was, I think, DFA'd and acquired by the Mariners mid-season. But we did talk about him at the time when the Giants acquired him. The write-up on him was that he's kind of a corner guy, first base, third base, possibly even right field, left field, and that he's kind of a platoon guy and that he can hit for power against left-handed pitching. And so the Giants recently acquired him. And what did he do? He hit three home runs in a game just the other day, and he had four total home runs in four games with the Sacramento River Cats. Struck out just 15% of the time, isolated power 706. I mean, he just put up bonkers numbers in a four game sample for AAA, and then boom, the Giants call him up against a lefty pitcher. So tonight, they're going to see Tony Gonsolin reportedly, and he's a right handed pitcher. It would not totally shock me if the Dodgers start Gonsolin and then bring in maybe Tyler Anderson for bulk innings, maybe to get the Giants to set a lineup to face a righty, and then you end up seeing maybe four innings of Gonsolin and then three innings of a lefty. That's probably not what they're going to do when I look at the how they've used Gonsolin. He's gone three innings, four innings, six innings, four innings. So it's probably more of a traditional starter's role for Gonsolin. But to me, that kind of plays into the Giants' hand because they probably have Mike Yastrzemski coming back tonight. So it could mean that Kevin Padlow could be sent out for Mike Yastrzemski coming back. It could be Luke Williams. They've got all these right-handed players who were in there for just last night. And moving forward, I mean, the Giants play the Dodgers for these two games. And then after that, They go back home and play the Cardinals for four games and then the Colorado Rockies. So obviously they need to be looking at uh, who's going to pitch in those games for the Colorado Rockies. When I look at the Rockies starting rotation, they do have a couple of lefties mixed in there. So 
I'm just saying it could be that Kevin Padlow was really called up for this one game and that they send him out tonight if they activate Mike Yastrzemski, which I think, again, you're going to see a very different lineup against a righty starter tonight than you saw last night with a lefty starter on the mound for the Dodgers. But anyway, that's kind of the story of Kevin Padlow. Like I said, the Giants have used cash to like jump in front of the waiver line because you have about a week, or I think exactly a week, from the time you DFA somebody to work out a trade before you have to like put the player on waivers. I'm not exactly sure of the timing, but you can work out a trade with another team first and then put them on waivers. Like if you if you can't work out a trade, I think you have to put them on waivers. And anyway, the Giants have been using cash to purchase these players who have been designated for assignment to jump the waiver line. And so they did that with Kevin Padlow. They did it with Mike Ford. And they did it with somebody else. I'm not exactly remembering. There's been so many guys. I'm blanking on the third guy. But there was somebody else they recently acquired via trade. Oh, Isan Diaz from the Miami Marlins. We haven't even really heard much about him. Lefty, second baseman, formerly a top prospect, was part of the Christian Yelich trade. Intriguing guy, has done very well at the upper levels of the minors, but has really, really struggled in the major leagues in, I think, exactly 500 plate appearances. But it is interesting that they've been really active acquiring these guys who have jumped onto their 40-man roster. And with the COVID IL, I've talked about this a lot, but the four guys they have on the COVID IL it opens up a 40-man roster spot. So it does seem like they're kind of using those open spots to bring these guys in, add them to the 40-man, but they might end up getting DFA'd themselves. They also did this with a Dodgers pitcher who had just had Tommy John surgery, and the Dodgers had DFA'd him, and the Giants had either purchased or claimed. I forget. Nunez, I think, is his last name, and I'm forgetting the first name. But they acquired him one day, and then the next day they released him. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of activity still because they they can't, like when they add these four guys who are on the COVID IL back to the 40-man roster, they, they're going to have to clear spots in a corresponding move. So some of these guys who were recently acquired may end up getting DFA'd, but that's to be expected. So coming up next, we'll talk about who's coming back and when. We'll give you these injury updates. I also want to take a macro look at the standings and the run differential and all that and how it compares to the rest of the league. So even though things are looking a little squirrely right now and the Giants have lost four out of their last five games, they're still in a pretty good position and things should improve in the near term and medium term moving forward. So we'll talk about all of that in just a minute. But first, summer is coming and with summer, you're going to need some food on the go. Built Bars are the perfect snack to take with you on family vacations. Throw them in your bags, in your kids' backpacks. Make sure that everyone has a bar so you are fueled for your summer adventures. The best part about Built Bars is that they're healthy and delicious. No more sacrificing delicious food for health. With Built Bar, you can have both. And it's easy. All you have to do is go to Built.com and order now. All Built Bars and Puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate. That means you that with Built Bar, you can eat healthy and actually enjoy doing it. In a typical candy bar, you're talking about 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, dozens of net carbs. With Built Bar, just 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein in a typical bar. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, as promised, we're going to talk about who's coming back, give you some injury updates, and speculate a little bit about who's going to be kicked off the roster in order to bring these guys back. And we'll also take a macro look at the standings and the run differential and explain why even though things are a little squirrely right now the Giants are still in a pretty good position and we're like 14 percent of the way through the season so a ton of baseball left to be played a lot of time for things to normalize stabilize guys who have been off to slow starts to rebound something I've been wanting to mention not that this is what's happening this year but I'm reminded 
of like the 2020 season, Giants got off to an eight and 16 start through 24 games. I believe the Giants have they played 24 games right now, 23. So one more game, and they'll equal the number of games that made up that start of eight and 16. It was when Trevor Gott was blowing all those games in a row midseason, particularly those two games to the A's. They had big leads in back-to-back days, and they blew it with Trevor Gott giving up huge home runs in the ninth, I think, both times. And that put them at 8-16. and 16. I remember there was like a very critical piece written about them in The Athletic at that point saying that uh, they this season was just experimental and Gabe Kapler was just an experimental manager and Farhan Zaidi was an experimental president of baseball operations. There was the famous line that the organization was a mess top to bottom. So people were super negative about that 2020 team right about this way through the season, this many games through the season. And they ended up that year, not too much long after that, being above 500. They have they ultimately lost, I think, three out of four to the Padres at the end of the year. So they ended two games under 500. But they did go from 8-16 and 16 to being over 500 not too long after that. So it just goes to show you that this many games through the season is not really enough to say, okay, well, this is what they are and this is what they're going to be. So it goes the other way as well. If you're 14-9, and nine, you could end up having a bad season. It's not to say that you can't. And so the Giants are 14-9 and nine, and they have a 609 winning percentage. Let's keep that in mind. That comes out to about 99 wins. If you uh, if you just played like the Giants have played through 23 games, there have been ups, there have been downs. But overall, 14-9, 609 winning percentage, decimal. But if you multiply that times 162, you're getting 99 wins. And so I'm not saying you should do that. That's not really how projections work. And it's simply because 23 games is not necessarily predictive of the whole season at all, actually. So we can't do that. But I'm just saying they've played like on a pace of 99 wins so far. And their that record would either be first or second in every division in baseball. It would be first in the American League West, and that's it. Otherwise, it would be in second place in every division except the National League West, where the Giants are one game behind the Padres. So this division, I mean, the Reds, I'm looking at their division. My goodness, the Reds are 3-20. and 20. And in the National League West, the worst team is the D-backs right now at 12 and 13. So the division has been competitive and the Padres have been good. And that's not great for the Giants. But the Padres were also good through about 45 games last year. They were tied with the Giants for first place and the Dodgers were in third. So again, it's a long season. The Padres were expected to be great last year. They were really good for the start of the year through a significant number of games, and they ended up below 500. So long season, a lot of baseball left. Giants have a plus 32 run differential, which is ahead of the Padres. It's a, It continues to be third in the National League behind only the Dodgers and the Mets, and it is also better than any team in the American League except the Yankees. So the Giants have the fourth best run differential in baseball. So it's kind of crazy. Like I keep saying, when you look at their lineup and you look at a team like the Dodgers and the fact that the Giants are able to be competitive with those guys speaks to their ability to kind of squeeze out every last drop of production from everybody on their roster 40 deep, not just 26 man roster, but the whole 40 man roster. So it is impressive. But uh, so injury updates, Mike Yastrzemski probably the closest to returning and he could be back tonight. So look out for that. There would have to be a corresponding move. Like I said, it could be Kevin Padlow. It could be Luke Williams. It would probably be one of these righties. I don't think they're going to send out Luis Gonzalez just for adding Yastrzemski, especially because Lamont Wade Jr., who we thought might come back tonight, apparently he's in the AAA lineup today, and obviously that would mean he's not going to play tonight. They're not going to have him play for AAA and then come play against the Dodgers in the same day. So going to be probably later this week for Lamont Wade Jr., maybe once the Giants come back home. I mean, this is the last game in L.A., so I guess that would be a certainty. He's not going to play in L.A. if they're, if he's not playing tonight. Evan Longoria and Tommy LaStella began rehab assignments, and that is very good news because, I mean, we saw 
what's going on at third base. They've got to rely on a guy like Kevin Padlow when it could be Evan Longoria and the stability that he brings to that position. And Tommy LaStella, I just think it's good for him and it's good for Estrada to just, I mean, Estrada's played like every inning of every game. He could just simply use a break. But in addition, the uh, I think that Tommy LaStella against right-handed pitching is just going to throw out uh, really good at bats like he did for much of last year. He's got some power. He makes a ton of contact. He's got a good eye. So I think that Tommy LaStella is very much going to help this team against right-handed pitching. There was also a pretty good report on Anthony DiSclafani, Tony DiSclafani coming back at some point. I don't, I somehow didn't copy that note, but he's not like, it's not an imminent return, but they had good news to report yesterday. And the initial report from about a week ago was that he was a few weeks away. So I guess he's probably still on track or maybe a little bit ahead of schedule. We'll provide a more concrete update tomorrow. Anyway, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked on MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, please call him Sully, brings you his unique perspective on the Major League's past and present. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it, leaving a review, telling your friends and family to check us out. Thank you so much in advance, and thank you to everyone who's done so already. Giants versus Dodgers again tonight. On the mound for the Giants is going to be Alex Wood against his former team. Expect to see Jock Peterson back in the lineup. He was able to pinch hit last night. Maybe not in the lineup. Maybe they're still not comfortable with him playing defense, but hopefully in the lineup and maybe with Yastrzemski as well. So we'll talk about all of that tomorrow. I can't wait to be with you then. Thanks again for listening. Stay locked on Giants.